We welcome all of you in the room today, as well as our virtual audience. I want to give a shout out to Takeda for supporting this effort and acknowledge our speakers who are here um, again with us. And we're so proud of the lineup for today. Before we begin, I would like to introduce the program coordinator, Dr. Darlene Kelly, and as well as acknowledge her work pulling this together, I want to recognize her years and years of service to Oli. As medicine and science advisor for her your many years of tireless service as Oli's science and medicine advisor, the Oli community cannot imagine carrying on without you. Your direction, compassion, and inspiration have been truly remarkable. Thank you, Joe. This way. Camera's oh, on. Oh, okay. All right. Well, I have to tell you the phone call I got the first day I was retired. It was at, oh, sorry, the very first day that I was retired, I was still asleep. You know, it was 6 o'clock in Minnesota, and it was Joan Bishop on the other end saying, you're late to work. You're starting today. <laughs> so I just said, well, I'll have to change my clothes then and get a, a plane ticket quickly. So anyway, it's been a pleasure working with Oli and uh, for many years prior to that, like about 22 years, I was the director of the Home Parental Nutrition Program at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. And I just might mention that one of the people who's going to be following me up is, is kind of sitting in the center of the... Manpreet. Not Manpreet, sorry. <laughs> We've been laughing about how long his name is, and he may have to say it. It's Jithan, well, I knew, knew him as Etik Annabeth Varyel. <laughs> yeah, so get, start learning how to spell that name because you might be communicating with him. So at any rate, uh, the thing that kind of brought this particular uh, session up was the death of four, four clinicians who were outstanding clinicians with Ole and with Aspen. Um, these would have been, yeah, I have a picture that just isn't very good, so, um, but I, I do have the names down here. Gisela Barnados, Barnados, who was a dietitian in the Washington, D.C. area. Sadly, I did not know her, and she died about four or five years ago. Um, Marcia Boatwright, I did know her very well. She was an amazing, amazing nurse. And I always told Marcia that I got more, I spoke to her more than any other person in the world during the night when she called to say so-and-so has gone into the ER in whatever state it was in, and I've asked them to call you probably around 3 a.m. So um, I really have appreciated Marcia over these years, and she died last July. Melinda Parker, who was a dietitian with Quorum Healthcare. Uh, Melinda, I sort of knew, and um, what the people at Quorum said was that she was a trailblazer in developing standardized home parenteral nutrition, dietitian orientation and training. And then the fourth one who died during this time, I think almost everybody who has been associated with um, Aspen and, and um, also with, with the Oli Foundation, Doug Seidner. This was a real shocker to so many of us this past summer. I don't remember exactly when it was, maybe August, September, somewhere in that time frame. Um, Doug was a gastroenterologist at the Cleveland Clinic, and he was an amazing friend. 
We often met at various meetings where we both were speaking. It came to it as a tremendous shock when we had heard this, and it was a huge loss to the Cleveland Clinic and to home parenteral nutrition. Um, I remember one meeting where Doug and I were, <coughs> were uh, speaking at this, the advanced practice course <coughs> at the Ole meeting, at the, sorry, at the Aspen meeting, and Doug called me the night before and said, I'm stuck in Cleveland. It's been snowing, and I probably won't get there, so you guys can do our talk. And then the next morning early, he called me. Well, they got me to uh, Atlanta, but I'm stuck there because of the snow. So there we were in Tennessee for this meeting. And um, when, when we were talking, I, well, first of all, the other person was a, a pharmacist uh, from the uh, cancer hospital in, in Texas. <clears throat> And um, he, so anyway, he said, well, you're the doctor. You can do the talk. <laughs> so thank you very much. But we did. And it's a good thing that Doug really worked way ahead on these talks. We, we got, were preparing it in the prior July. So at any rate, um, I was always saying, if Dr. Seidner were here, he would have said X, Y, Z. So some things you just never forget. So uh, this is in remembrance of those four outstanding clinicians. Yes? There is someone else, uh, very active in Aspen, in Aspen, who passed March 7th, uh, Lee Varela. Uh, she was very active in Aspen because of the center okay. publishing. She published articles very well known to the nursing section. Um, and uh, for 20 years uh, with Aspen. Okay. All right. Well, and I know there will be many more, but what Quorum is doing is offering a scholarship to applicants who will be able to come to the Aspen meeting for two years each um, as a, a award, and we're hoping we can get some interest in home parental nutrition as a type of practice that they might use. So at any rate... What we've decided to do is use a perspective. Well, that's not in there. Okay, perspective on HPN through the past decades and into the future, and we're hoping that people will become more inspired with um, home parental nutrition to be clinical directors, etc. So anyway, um, some of the points that we really want to make are that. People can become interested in this. And you will hear at the end of our talk a man who I was the doctor for who's been on home parental nutrition for 44 years. Um, and he's been amazing and had very few problems. So uh, stick around till the end of this talk. So to talk about the uh, preliminary parts of it, Uh, Dr. Ann Mischlich from uh, Albany Medi Medical Center, and she's the one who has stepped into Lynn Howard's position, and um, she's, she did have a, oh, she specializes in clinical nutrition, and she uh, completed her fellowship with Oli's co-founder, Lynn Howard. So at any rate, the other speaker will be uh, Dr. Charlene Comfer. Uh, she's a professor of nutrition science at the University of Pennsylvania, and she's worked with patients for some time who uh, required home parental nutrition. For the past 25 years, she, um, uh, she values the rich history of the development of home parental nutrition from the beginning to the current days. She's a former president of Aspen. So uh, they will together be doing a section on uh, bringing parental nutrition from its beginning to the home. Oh, 
Okay, so, and Thank you very much, Dr. Kelly, for that nice introduction. Um, I'm Ann Mekalik, as she said. I'm a nutrition support physician at Albany Medical Center in Albany, New York. I sort of think of myself as second generation nutrition support. Um, when I was in internal medicine in early 1980s doing my residency, parental nutrition was sort of in its infancy and was mostly in hospitals. Um, Dr. Lynn Howard and other leaders in parental nutrition were undertaking um, an even more challenging uh, scenario and trying to move patients to home on parental nutrition. Um, so things were very different back then and we've come a long way um, in improving home parental nutrition for our patients. Uh, but we also have lots of new challenges that we're facing now um, to ensure that all the patients who require uh, home parental nutrition are able to get the therapy and to have um, you know, a high level of care for their therapies. So my tasks for today are, I'm going to take a really brief look back at what patients did back then when they first went home and what it was like. And I'm going to give a little shout out to Dr. Ezra Steiger, who was initially going to do this, who is in the first generation of home nutrition specialists. Um, but he's busy accepting his uh, Lifetime Achievement Award right now. But he did provide the slides that you'll be seeing. Um, and then I'm going to list some of the challenges that we're facing now, and then I'm going to turn the program over to Dr. Comfer, who's going to share some details of her program at University of Pennsylvania. And then we hope to have some discussion following the other presenters um, about how we can face our new challenges and maybe get some ideas from participants as well. Um, so let me see here. So I just showed this slide as an example to demonstrate what we can achieve with home parental nutrition. Um, we're all familiar with the patient on the left that we see who's starving, has multiple in intestinal challenges, malabsorbing, and um, before parental nutrition, most of the time these patients couldn't survive because they couldn't get nutrition. So now we're all familiar with seeing patients move from the left of that slide to the right of that slide. We restore their nutrition, their health, their quality of life, and they go when they live a normal life and on their home parental nutrition. Um, now um, helping those patients um, to recover and thrive is still at the center of what we do in nutrition support. Um, so if you can think back to the early days of parental nutrition, there were lots of hurdles that needed to be addressed, and it required a multidisciplinary team. Physician, pharmacy, dietitians, nurses, social workers are all addressing the medical, the social, educational challenges, financial challenges. Um, and the, and the teams were meeting regularly to review the cases, and, uh, and uh, that is happening a lot of the time um, still in centers, um, but it's not always the case for, for um, all of our patients. So if we, if we think that the providers gave a lot of their time back then, the patients made a huge commitment um, of time and energy there were no home infusion companies. So these pa patients would drive their cars or their trucks up to the loading dock at the back of the hospital. They would load cartons of supplies, components of TPN into their cars and they would drive them home and they had to have a huge storage capability to keep all of this stuff. This is just an example of how they would lay it out. This is how much room it took. And they needed lots of organization to, to make it work. They were doing everything that the home infusion, not everything, but a lot of what the home infusion companies are doing now, the patients were all doing on their own. They had to be taught sterile technique. They were drawing up every single individual component. So here's one day 
of their uh, parenteral nutrition. You got their dextrose or amino acids, all the electrolytes, multivitamins, sterile masks, sterile gloves, everything that they needed, and they did this every single night. And then they hooked themselves up. Um, so we know we've come a long way. This is a patient sort of mixing up her formula. And I'm showing the early team from Cleveland Clinic. Um, and you can see that the teams over time are kind of getting bigger and bigger at the Cleveland Clinic, which is a great thing that's happening there, but it's not happening everywhere. And this is uh, some of our challenges. And so while it's always really great to look back and see how much progress we've made, and we certainly have made a lot of progress, um, we still have lots of challenges that we're facing right now. And so this is what we're going to fo focus on moving forward to the rest of the um, conference today is where are we going, what's happening um, newly, but some of the issues that we face are that there are fewer and fewer specially trained and experienced home parental nutrition providers. There are limited training programs available for people who might in fact be interested in doing that. Um, and there's lack of reimbursement um, for managing these patients. And so we're losing uh, and we're not developing new talent in the area. And there's limited understanding of the importance of home parental nutrition by a lot of our administrators and decision makers who are responsible for um, providing uh, support institutionally. Um, and a, we're currently in a reimbursement environment which is, quote, value-based, but home parental nutrition value isn't really something that I think is even on the table. So I'm going to turn the program over now to um, Dr. Confer, who's going to talk about her um, program and offer you know, one option, for, um, and hopefully we'll talk about some other um, options as we move forward today. Thanks, Anne, and thanks, Dr. Kelly, for the lovely introduction. And I hope that I can, nope. We apparently all named our slides the same thing, which is not great. <laughs> OK, here we go. So. Um, I was asked to do this talk in part because we are all concerned about the problem of um, not having enough physician, home PN physicians to cover the, um, the care of these patients. So what I'm going to do is give you a lightning ride through the last 20 years in my home PN practice. Um, and first talk about the dynamics that have forced us to make transitions. Um, we were the first nutrition support team in the U.S. founded by Stanley Dudrick back in the day, but our team grew much as Ezra Steigers did under the leadership of Jim Mullen um, into a multi-professional team practice. Now, my hospital is famous for valuing data, and Mullen is a data maven, and so they quickly pulled him into high-level hospital administration, and he ended up uh, managing about half of all the operations in the hospital. At that point, 20 years ago, he stepped back from the nutrition support team. Um, we have an internist who was trained by Jim Mullen, um, <clears throat> and he's wonderful, but he has limited time capability because this is not the only part of his practice. Um, another trait that he brought to us that we hadn't seen before was a comfort level with collaborating and sponsoring nurse practitioners. Um, the insurance challenges have already been mentioned. In the U.S., our reimbursement for 
um, visits and for even signing orders is just not adequate to pull young physicians into this field. Um, another dynamic that's been going on a lot in the U.S. and certainly affected our hospital was the fact that our flagship hospital, the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, acquired three other smaller satellite hospitals in the city and others in nearby regions. Um, our health system embraced the electronic medical record in a big league way by about 2006. And as a result of all of this, our clinical nutrition support service um, became a clinical department not affiliated with the food service, a clinical department that needed to integrate more fully within the medical and surgical service lines of the hospital. So this is our organizational structure. Our director today is a registered dietitian. We have a total of 30 full-time employees working along service lines. Um, and this is an older picture of our team. Now we are 30 people. This is Bruce Kanozian, who is the internist in charge of our program. And these were our two advanced practice nurses until recently. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the inpatient nutrition support team because it feeds the home PN program. The um, inpatient team is a clinical department that bridges three hospitals in the city of Philadelphia and it role models for other affiliated hospitals. So anything we set up at the flagship hospital is also available to all the others. Um, the team members are embedded in medical and surgical service lines, not geographic care locations. The inpatient RD recommends and pens PN and EN orders that are then signed by the primary care service, either the house staff or the inpatient advanced practice provider. Um, we have structured fields in the electronic medical record so that the details of the EN and PN order can be downloaded for quality assurance or research. But also, there is some decision support for providers writing those orders. There are alerts for PN stability. And all of the orders and all of the labels are designed according to Aspen recommendations, thanks to Joe Bellotta. The nutrition assessment details are also discrete measurable fields within the EMR. And this is important because it has greatly enhanced our ability to have the uh, providers recognize malnutrition as an important issue. Um, and it has had a significant impact on coding, proper coding for malnutrition and reimbursement. So then the inpatient RDs alert the home PN nurse practitioner that a patient is a potential discharge. We had challenges, though. We had limited resources. Our program volume totally outstripped our staffing resources. And this led to a challenging work-life balance for the team members. We really had not had incremental staffing since 1999. And our satellite hospitals had no home PN management. So we had the flagship hospital with this nutrition support team providing great quality care. And we had other hospitals that had nothing or that um, <clears throat> a physician was managing them in, on a one-off basis. The coordination with the home care companies was really labor intensive. Lots and lots of telephone calls patient safety risks for transcription errors, paper orders that required the provider to be on site to sign them. Um, the EMR documentation in the early days was all in text notes, and text notes cannot be, the data can't be pulled back. 
they weren't easily accessible to any external provider, such as the home PN company, and there was no documentation of the work that went into the um, into the home PN discharge, which is important because if you can document patient activities, you have a much better chance of increasing staffing levels. And we had no electronic orders, so everything was by fax or verbal order, which is a potential regulatory problem. So what have we done in the past two years? Uh, our major home care company hired one nurse practitioner to be able to service these satellite hospitals. We trained that same nurse practitioner with our other nurse practitioners. We also hired yet another nurse practitioner. So we have basically doubled our nurse practitioner staffing to four. Um, our home patient census, home PN census ranges between 125, 150, and now we have a much more reasonable um, patient care load per nurse practitioner. Um, okay, I've already talked about this. Of course, during COVID, I think almost everyone added telemedicine clinic hours, which the patients really resonate with. We expanded the clinic with combined on-site and telemedicine visits, and now we have a new monthly home PN operations meeting between all of the home PN team members and the administration of the department. There's also a monthly operation meeting between leadership in this uh, nutrition support team and leadership in our major home PN supplier. We have a monthly meeting with an infectious disease specialist to optimize CLABS prevention and management, and we have a consistent GI consultant. So there's a lot of support that goes beyond this one physician who is the collaborator for these nurse practitioners. We have optimized EMR use. We have now a navigator so that the nursing notes are uh, retrievable data, not just text fields. We have a nutrition, a new report, a registry. The outpatient PN order can be transferred electronically to the home PN company. Any order revisions can be e-faxed through the EMR, um, to all of which will reduce transcription errors. The nurse practitioners can sign home PN orders under the supervision of the collaborating physician. Okay, um, and we have shared reminder lists between the nurse practitioners and the home infusion company so that things happen in a timely fashion. We are <clears throat> working to optimize our home PN and hydration order sets and to um, enhance lab orders so that they are collected in the right time frame. We're training pharmacists in our home PN company and we are trying to work flow uh, who owns what so that we can get a better solution to any problems that come up. Now, all of that said, our model does not obviate the need for a well-trained home PN physician. What it does do is it gives greater support for the physician working with us and streamlines patient care to the degree possible. Um, our model has improved the quality of patient care. Our patients tell us this. We are delivering care to patients in satellite hospitals that did not have a team to manage them before. We've reduced the risk of med errors. We have greater CRNP staffing levels, so they are much more likely to stay with us. Um, and our telemedicine visits permit us to evaluate patients that have a lot of challenge coming in. Working across the entire health system, as opposed to in one single medical practice, has brought um, EMR documentation to a higher level than one service could probably do. And our integrated approaches between the main home care company and the home PN team 
give us the opportunity to recognize problems and deal with them quickly. We are in succession planning for our physician member and also for our dietitian specialist as I transition more toward research than the home PN uh, management per se. So keep that in mind and thank you very much for your attention. All right, thank you for that. And we're gonna save the questions for the end, but uh, keep using the website to send me questions. I, I can see those. Uh, so, you know, now that we've seen, you know, the past of home parental nutrition, uh, we're gonna shift focus to the current practice and approaches. And we have uh, two tremendous speakers. Both are actually transplant surgeons. Uh, the first speaker is uh, Dr. Iyer, Kishore Iyer, Director of Adult and uh, Pediatric Intestinal Rehabilitation and Transplant at the Mount Sinai. Uh, obviously, professor of uh, surgery. And the only person I have seen give a 45 minute presentation off of one slide. Quite, a, quite an honor. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Deborah Sudan. She's a chief of uh, abdominal transplant surgery, a professor of surgery and professor of pediatrics at Duke University. And I think she is doing. She's in Singapore today doing a transplant. So she's doing it. So she'll be joining virtually or? Yeah. She's, yeah. She recorded the talk. Perfect. So we'll turn over to Dr. I. Thank you, Manfred, for that, uh, uh, I don't even know what to call it, introduction. Um, this is the warning about know who your friends are and what they'll say about you. Okay, so you've heard a lot about home PN, and I have to confess, uh, I look after, I'm an intestinal transplant surgeon, adult and pediatric. I'm very interested in intestinal failure. Have really no interest in home PN, even less expertise in home PN. I do it out of necessity because of the problem you've heard. It's very difficult to find uh, providers uh, and the challenges that many of the patients face accessing them. And that's really why I embarked on this, my now passion project. Um, here are my disclosures. Uh, none particularly relevant to the content of this talk. Um, I want to talk to you about Project ECHO, and if you're interested in things like this, uh, I would encourage you to Google uh, Project ECHO and look at some of the wonderful things they've done in the, um, in the space of global health, public health, and, and the challenge of lack of expertise. So Project ECHO, ECHO stands for Expanding Community Healthcare Outcomes is the brainchild of Dr. Sanjeev Arora, a hepatologist at New Mexico. He first used this model to improve outcomes of hepatitis C, treated by non-specialist clinicians in New Mexico about 10 years ago, at a time when he was the only hepatologist in all of New Mexico. There's the website. Fast forward, that's sort of a heat map of the US showing active echo sites. Some technical issues, yeah. Those are the principles of the ECHO model, and you can see the obvious A, B, C, D. Not a coincidence that I went into surgery and like to keep things simple. Um, amplification, using technology to leverage scarce resources. And the scarce resource we're talking about here is expertise. B, to share best practices to reduce disparity and to try and improve outcomes. C, what most of us as clinicians have used and not even realized it, case-based learning to master complexity. And then D, the power of data, using data and metrics to monitor what you're doing. And as I've told Sanjeev now quite emphatically, he paid less attention to the E, which is evaluation. He's been a very, very good implementer, not so good evaluator, but is changing fast. I want to emphasize that there's a big difference between echo and telemedicine. In telemedicine, as you'll see in the bottom uh, third of the panel, there's still a one-to-one -one relationship with the 
physician or the clinician caring for the patient. It doesn't change the problem of lack of expertise. ECHO, in contrast, should be viewed as telelearning. The responsibility for care of the patient rests with the non-specialist clinicians in the community, wherever the patient is. All that the model does is to try and distribute the expertise to the non-specialist clinician. Thus, uh, if you like, democratizing knowledge and spreading the limited expertise available. So what's the evidence that there's a need for an ECHO project in chronic intestinal failure, my, my area of interest? We actually acquired the evidence post-fact. We launched the ECHO project and then said, now let's find the evidence. But nevertheless, we developed and then validated a knowledge survey in chronic intestinal failure in partnership with Medscape, an online medical education platform. We then deployed it to a fairly large cohort of US gastroenterologists. And we, as you can see, we got, um, we got back about 100 surveys. And especially because this is the US, there was a high percentage of self-described experts. <laughs> now, for those of you who are familiar with ROC curves, this is the ROC curve for our knowledge survey. And think about it this way. If, if the ROC curve looked like the diagonal you see there, then our knowledge survey is just as good as flipping a coin in distinguishing between the two. As the curve moves towards the top left corner, as our ROC curve did, it becomes much more sensitive and specific at distinguishing between experts and non-experts. So we developed this on the basis of a convenient sample. This is now, this paper has just come out. But the results of the survey showed what many of us in the room already know, that most US gastroenterologists one way for me to ensure I don't get any holiday cards from any gastroenterologist, there was a complete lack of expertise or near complete lack of expertise among community gastroenterologists in the US. So it made the case for the ECHO project that we'd already launched. There's our website if you're interested in what we're doing, I'd encourage you to go see it. But that's the anatomy of an echo, if you like. It's a one-hour session. We launched it as a one-hour virtual clinic. Think of it as a professorial case-based grand rounds in a hospital. There's a brief introduction. Somebody presents an anonymized case to a standard template. I facilitate discussion around the case. We provide summary recommendations. The presenting clinician or physician still retains full responsibility for the patient and there is a didactic at the end of it by a whole group of amazing experts from around the world, some of them in this room on this panel. We now have archived about 60, 70 such didactics on our website. Every ECHO program needs a physical host. That's in Mount Sinai where I'm based. We have a really powerhouse of an expert medical advisory board uh, of like-minded clinicians and some non-clinicians, some third-party payers, Members of OLE, Joan Bishop, keeps me honest. Uh, we're supported by the ECHO Institute in Albuquerque. We started with two adult clinics per month. We recently added one pediatric clinic about a month ago, about six months ago. As I said, all didactics are archived. This whole thing is free for participants, by the way. And there's very quickly some metrics. I want to watch the time. Um, our average participation per module, we have it are organized in modules of eight clinics. The idea being if you attend a whole module, you get some basic understanding and knowledge of HPN and intestinal failure. As you can see, the program grew very rapidly. In our first module, we averaged 44 participating sites. In the module just completed, we're averaging over 130 participating sites. Uh, you can see the number of discrete participants in the modules. There's what the geographic distribution looks like. Module one, we had participation from 27 states in Washington, DC. Most recent module, we now have participation from 42 states and DC. We have international participants. Um, representation from six of the seven continents. I have many women in my life keeping me honest. My wife said, what's happening in Antarctica? <laughs> We're working on it. We're working on it. 
There's the uh, uh, participation by discipline. And we can pull a lot of metrics. Uh, we can actually track our people looking at our didactics. Are they paying attention? And they are. They go back to see the didactic videos. And we know when they're watching. Big Brother is watching you. I won't dwell on this. I've already said um, we initially had some preliminary data. Now we have a better knowledge survey. Uh, we've published it. There is a need for formal evaluation to ensure we understand the problem. What is the magnitude of the problem of lack of expertise in intestinal failure? There are local, regional, cultural contexts. We have to ensure the knowledge we are providing is appropriate, it's relevant. Is it based on best practices? Can it influence behavior? And ultimately, the big question, will it actually improve patient outcomes? And to ensure we can get funding. I won't belabor this, but if anybody is interested in what I'm talking about, please find me. I promise I'll buy the wine. We can talk. In my closing minute or so, uh, when one door opens, I said this to somebody earlier today, when one door opens, when one door closes, some other door will open. When one door opens, sometimes many doors open. And that's what's happened. Where these are upcoming projects, hopefully all within the year. Uh, we're currently working on developing a chronic intestinal failure disease activity index because we don't have any short to medium term measure of intestinal failure disease activity. Think of the Crohn's disease activity index, for example. We're tentatively June, we're going to launch an intestinal failure 101 module jointly with the American College of Gastroenterology to target ACG members. Um, we are getting ready to do a formal developmental evaluation of our pediatric lift echo. We're working on developing, since we have a lot of the didactic material already, we're working on an open access multimedia case-based manual of intestinal failure and HPN, perhaps in partnership with Oli, hint, hint. Um, pending NIH funding, we're getting ready to start a five-year national project to disseminate Lift Echo to improve outcomes with some very ambitious goals. In partnership with Optum Home Infusion, I want to give a shout out to Penny Allen if you're hearing. They've been amazing partners in um, trying to develop this. It has a novel randomized trial design to answer the very challenging question, if you do something like this, can you measurably improve patient outcomes? That's my conclusion slide. I'll just leave it there for you to mull over so I don't get beaten by Joan when I go down for taking a minute extra. Thank you all. We never ask you to go back up. <laughs> Be warned. I can spend 45 minutes on one slide. So the... While I launch this, I'm going to say, do I have 30 seconds for one quick anecdote? You heard about the late Doug Seidner. We were very good friends. For anybody who knew Doug Seidner, it was impossible not to be a friend. And for those who know me, I would tell Doug Seidner, you are the Eeyore to my Tigger. And Doug was one of a few select group of friends that I routinely sought counsel from, especially if I thought my idea was wild and irresponsible. So when I thought of Lift Echo, I called him. He hesitated, hummed and hawed. He said, let me think about it, I'll write to you. And he wrote me a long one-page email, all the reasons he thought this was a stupid idea and why it would not work. To pay him back, I made him do the first didactic. <laughs> Rest in peace, Doug Seidner. Uh, somebody else has to do the volume. Deb is presenting this um, present virtually. on quality of life after intestine transplantation. And I'm very sorry I wasn't able to join you in person for this important meeting. Today I'll review the definition of quality of life, um, including some measures of both objective and subjective. And then also describe the um, studies that have been published after intestinal transplantation regarding quality of life. Also uh, looking at um, comparative groups, uh, persons who are doing the assessments and whether or not the tools have been validated. So 
one might consider quality of life uh, from various aspects of things that people enjoy. But when we look at the actual definition of quality of life, Wikipedia says that it uh, describes the general well-being of an individual. And the World Health Organization goes a little bit further, suggesting that it's an individual's per perception of their position in life in context of their values and their goals. The WHO further um, divides quality of life into various domains, including physical, mental, and social um, sense of well-being, and not just simply the absence of disease. So other things that are important when we talk about quality of life are um, the properties such as validity. Does the instrument that we use measure what it's supposed to measure? Is it reliable and can it produce consistent results if there are no change over time? And is it responsive to changes uh, when they do occur? Furthermore, um, the CDC suggested that we do uh, we use measures that are validated um, and in assessing the well-being of individuals rather than unvalidated tests, whether these be generic or disease specific. And why do we care about this? Well, it's been shown that a patient's level of health-related quality of life has been linked to adherence behaviors and possibly the maintenance of graft function. And as we look at intestinal transplant, this is very important. So my first foray into quality of life actually came when I was invited to give a talk on quality of life uh, many years ago and found a paucity of data in the literature so I set out, uh, along with my colleagues at the University of Nebraska at the time, to assess quality of life. And we decided to look at a number of things that we thought might impact quality of life, such as hospitalization, um, presence of an ostomy, uh, whether or not they were enterally autonomous, and whether or not the children um, grew after transplant at an appropriate rate. Others similarly looked at uh, such objective measures in terms of quality of life. And here, Gondolisi et al. added things like rejection episodes um, and impact of infections and renal function. And others have shown, as we did in our study, that growth um, is achieved normally in up to 50% and perhaps with longer follow-up, as many as 80% of recipients. Um, and this is similar to what we see in liver transplantation, but a caution here is that this may not be consistent across all organs, as kidney recipients did not show the same catch-up growth. Um, and again, as I mentioned, enteral autonomy is uh, nearly universal in patients who receive intestinal transplant, being 90% in this study from Paris. But I would argue that these findings, while um, they appeared to be accurate, may not actually tr truly measure quality of life, according to the WHO definition um, requiring a uh, perspective from the individual themselves. So what tools do we have that take into account the patient's perspective? Well, some of the early measures um, that have been used are generic, um, and one is the Kronofsky scale, which I will review. But this one is, again, an external rater, um, even though it's the most common one that's been reported. Finally, we do recognize that there's some differences between self-report and other proxy reports, and this raises some caution. So to get started, here's the Karnofsky scale, 100% being normal uh, function with no evidence of disease, and the lower the score, the more the disability. Here you can see the International um, Small Bowel Registry uh, showed improvement or excellent quality of life after transplantation and excellent functional status in both adults and children with approximately 70% showing minimal or no um, uh, disability. So when we look for studies of validated tools um, that examine all three domains of quality of life, we really find that there are several generic tools that have been published, as well as a few that have been adapted from disease-specific tools, and I'll go through those in some detail. So the first study um, using a validated generic tool uh, was performed again by our group in um, Nebraska when I was there. And what you'll see in columns A and B is that the children in this study um, assessed their quality of life strikingly similar to a US um, healthy norm control population. 
In contrast, the parent proxy scores, as indicated in the red box, were significantly lower uh, than the children's self-assessment in terms of social functioning, uh, general health, and mental health. And furthermore, when parent proxy scores from intestinal recipients were compared to parent um, proxy scores for normal uh, US uh, children, there were substantial differences, especially in the area of family activities um, compared to normal healthy children, such as uh, uh, parental impact on emotion and parental impact on time. And Interestingly, intestinal transplant recipients rated their quality of health better than a comparative group of end-stage renal disease uh, children, which may be a, another proxy for patients with chronic illness. In this study from the um, UCLA, they also used the child health questionnaire and found very similar reports as to what we reported um, several years earlier. They also used another instrument that um, instead of just testing children from five to 18, were able to, uh, using parent proxy, also assess children down to the age of two. In the PEDS quality of life or PEDS QL um, tool, however, they did find there were some differences in the children's self-assessment with decreased school functioning. And this was true in the parent proxy as well. Although parents also noted there was some decrease in physical health and psychosocial health, again, compared to US norms. In adults, the SF36 has been used in a similar fashion, but rather than comparing it to uh, normal healthy controls, they compared to both patients who are stable on parenteral nutrition, as well as those with complicated intestinal failure. And as you can see in this small study from England, there was a substantial, um, substantially better uh, at quality of life reported from small bowel transplant recipients, particularly when compared to the um, complicated intestinal failure patients who might be it, it might have indications for intestinal transplantation. And this was particularly seen with higher scores on the Nottingham Health Profile in, for example, energy and pain higher in this profile, meaning worse, and lower scores in um, uh, the complicated intestinal failure patients in terms of physical and emotional well-being, um, as well as so social functioning compared to small bowel transplant recipients. <clears throat> Here, the higher score is better. Another uh, study that um, looked at the SF36 as the tool to evaluate adults' um, quality of life, they compared uh, serial or longitudinal assessments, one done pre-transplant and the other at the time of listing, as well as six months after transplant. In their study of 11 patients, you can see here approximately 50%, even at six months after transplant, reported better quality of life utilizing the SF36, although 25% uh, still showed a lower quality of life at that time. This may be due to the fact that many of the patients, at least, uh, at least half and closer to two thirds, had multivisceral transplants, which are known to have a long recovery time after transplantation because of their long hospitalization. But when they grouped the um, scores pre-transplant versus post-transplant across all patients, what they found was there was improved uh, functional, uh, physical functioning scores, um, as well as uh, overall general health in the transplant population after transplantation. So when we look for disease specific measures, we noted that there are still no intestine transplant specific measures published. There is one attempt in the literature regarding a pediatric transplant specific questionnaire, but this pools all solid organ transplant recipients, which does have, as I noted earlier, some uh, potential bias because of differences amongst the transplant recipients in terms of outcomes. Then I'll review also a quality of life uh, questionnaire uh, from Pittsburgh that had been adapted from a validated liver transplant instrument, although it has not been validated for use in intestinal transplant patients or parenteral nutrition patients. And finally, a uh, um, parenteral nutrition questionnaire that has been developed, again, not validated in intestinal recipients. 
So first looking at the um, multi-center study, um, here we, we look at uh, an attempt to develop in uh, transplant specific quality of life uh, tool, which is certainly an advancement over generic quality of life tools. Um, in this study, there were uh, over 200 participants, uh, 199 of which were able to perform self-assessments and nearly 250 um, that had parent proxy reports. Again, we do see um, <clears throat> some similarities and some differences. In this case, across both the self-assessments and the parent proxy, proxy scores, we found some decrease in uh, each of the domains compared to healthy norms. Um, and in this case, there was less difference between the child assessments and the parent proxy. I might say some of this could be result of um, longer time after transplantation, as well as the potential that um, the uh, patients were a little bit older in an age group where we found um, the scores generally for the self-assessments decreased um, in the adolescent age range. This is again a disease-specific tool, as I mentioned, the quality of life indicator um, that was used in intestinal transplantation patients, both pre- and post-transplant, and then compared to patients on parenteral nutrition. And here they found that um, many of the domains showed marked increase after transplant compared to either before transplant or patients that were stable on parenteral nutrition. But they also found two areas of concern where there was an increase in depression as well as um, problems with finances uh, post-transplant related to the other two comparative groups. Um, and as I mentioned, there's a um, parental nutrition questionnaire that had been developed for a disease-specific instrument that has also been adapted to intestinal transplant recipients. And in this case, there were very little difference noted between parental nutrition patients and intestinal transplant, although there were significant improvements in a few areas, including the ability to travel, the ability to eat and drink, and the ability to have employment. And a somewhat decreased uh, uh, complication in terms of uh, fatigue and a general improvement in general well-being or general health. So we take all of this also in context um, where as this study using the SF36, a generic instrument, evaluate, evaluated patients with parenteral nutrition against healthy norms in the population. And in this study, there was clearly a decrement in quality of life reported by patients on parental nutrition compared to healthy controls over all of the domains except for mental health. So the limitations in trying to evaluate quality of life after intestinal transplant is that there is still a dearth of information even almost two decades after the initial reports. There is no large registry or data source similar to NAPRTIX or SPLIT where we can pull this information and most studies are small and somewhat skewed by outliers. The available studies differ in design. Not all the tools used uh, in the studies have been validated in the population studies. And extrapolation of results from one age group to another may um, mis misinterpret uh, the outcomes in the other population. Having said that, um, we do know that the summary of morbidity after intestinal transplantation is not the quasi for quality of life, um, even when the summary of morbidity events is accurately reported. Quality of life indeed has to impact, assess the impact of the disease on the patient's well being and hopefully in all three aspects physical, mental health, and social. The measures and tools should be valid, reliable, and responsive, whether it's a generic or a disease specific um, tool. And we have to pay attention to whether or not self reports or proxy reports are um, what are being uh, described and what group is being compared to. So to summarize the finding, the published studies using generic instruments to date um, include self-assessments, which um, basically show similar um, outcomes after intestinal transplant to healthy controls. But parent proxy assessments have been shown to be lower than their children's assessment. Um, and some tools are available in younger age group. 
a transplant specific module is now available and requires further study to assess, especially comparing the different types of transplants um, and specifically used in intestine transplants. In the adult studies, as I said, it's not appropriate to simply extrapolate the pediatric results into um, adults as they may be different. In the use of generic quality of life instruments, both the SF36 and the Nottingham Health Profile showed considerably better scores comparing complicated intestinal failure patients to post-intestinal transplant recipients in many domains. And furthermore, they also improved in at least half of individuals studied longitudinally before and after transplantation, even though the post-transplantation um, study may be relatively early in the course. Um, when uh, tools have been adapted um, from disease-specific tools to intestinal transplantation, they may or may not be valid, and we don't know the answer to this. However, um, when we look at the quality or the um, tool developed by the University of Pittsburgh, although there are multiple studies um, uh, published, we looked at primarily the most recent one, and this showed improvements in multiple categories between the pre and post transplant, um, although it did note that there was worsening in finance and depression scores. And finally, the HEP uh, HPN quality of life tool comparing parenteral nutrition patients to intestinal transplant found a better global health status after intestinal transplant, as well as improvement in GI symptoms, ability to travel, and ability to work. So as Paul Thoreau said, I cannot make my days longer, so I strive to make them better. We hope that uh, quality of life will continue to improve for our intestinal transplant recipients. But in the meantime, in order to further assess this, we know that there's not currently a good organizational structure for data collection for intestinal transplant recipients in studying quality of life. And there are no specific validated disease um, specific tools. We need this information in order to guide individuals in decision making regarding candidacy and timing. However, the current published literature does seem to suggest that quality of life um, beyond the perioperative period is likely better after intestinal transplantation than for patients remaining on TPN and likely um, similar to healthy controls. I thank you for your attention and uh, wish I could be there with you in person for this important session. Um, and if I'm able to log in uh, from abroad, I will be available for All right, thank you um, so much. So now that we've gone through, you know, where HPN has been, uh, where we currently are in terms of home nutrition, uh, we'd like to move forward with where we're headed, especially in terms of science. And here we've got two uh, great speakers. Uh, the first speaker will be Dr. Mark Pewter. Um, he's a professor of surgery at Harvard Medical School um, and just has tremendous expertise in lipid emulsions, uh, fatty acid metabolism, and someone I rely on uh, tremendously for clinical uh, expertise. Uh, following him will be um, Pele Jeppesen, uh, who is uh, head of Department of Intestinal Failure and Liver Disease in Copenhagen. Um, he's also just tremendously published and a real expert in this field. So delighted to have them both. So turn it over to Dr. Pewter. Thank you, it's a pleasure speaking here today. And thank you for inviting me. That's not right, is it? It is, that works. Um, <clears throat> I wanna say that uh, we're gonna switch gears a little bit here. This is gonna be uh, more of a late stage research to advance uh, the field. Uh, it's, the goal of the research is to certainly improve the quality of life, reduce the morbidity and mortality in patients. Uh, I have many disclosures, but the ones for this are uh, on the advisory board for Alcresta and North Sea, and also funding for this. I have no intellectual property in what I'm going to be talking about. 
Now, short bowel syndrome, we have loss of intestinal function, we have malabsorption, and many of these patients are PN dependent. And in children, it's gastroschisis, intestinal atresia, malrotation with alveolus, necrotizing anacolitis. In adults, it's IBD, such as Crohn's disease, radiation, malignancy, vascular disease, uh, trauma, and so on. So one of the problems with short bowel syndrome is it has very life-limiting complications, especially in children as, such as central line infections, intestinal failure associated liver disease. Uh, these patients often have chronic diarrhea, fat malabsorption, protein malabsorption, and carbohydrates. Uh, they also, many of them have intestinal dysmotility, they have small bowel bacterial overgrowth, and they have many, many nutritional deficiencies. And a paper published recently, <clears throat> relatively recently, showed that um, patients who are being converted from PN to enteral have many, many micronutrient deficiencies. And it's also to note that patients that are, as most of you know, who go on to full enteral nutrition have many vitamin deficiencies, especially we see vitamin D deficiency. Now, just a little bit of physiology. So, Patients with short bowel syndrome or anyone, when you have a fatty diet, it has to be emulsified, then it has to be digested by lipases, and then it has to be in, um, micelles and then absorbed. Now, in patients who have 20 centimeters of jejunum, that whole process before that's completed, it's already out the stoma or as a bowel movement. And so we were thinking that maybe if we pre-digest food, uh, at least the lipids, it may be better. So elemental formulas are really not elemental in the sense of the lipids, those are triglycerides. And so uh, the company Alcresta has this Relizor cartridge, which has beads, and on the beads it has lipases on it. So by the time it goes from the cartridge to the patient, the fatty acids, it's already free fatty acids and monoglycerides. So as soon as it hits the stomach, it's ready to be absorbed. And so our simple hypothesis was uh, prehydrolysis of fat and enteral formula will improve fat and fat-soluble vitamin absorption. And our previous data in piglets, where we did a 75% bowel resection, these are six-week-old piglets, uh, we place, we remove their bowel, remove 75% of it, we put them on continuous central feeds, and they use this device which is more compatible with many more formulas and is experimental. And we did a 14-day study. And what we found was that vitamin D absorption, this is the untreated, this is at the time of resection, and at the end of resection, vitamin D levels increased dramatically and they increased in the uh, normal control animals. However, also vitamin E had the same effect, so we were able to improve vitamin E absorption. And we also, there was also better absorption of fat for, as measured by the fractional excretion of fat. So our next hypothesis was prehydrolysis of fat and formula will reduce the parental nutrition requirement. In this experiment, we found some very surprising results. First of all, we took these piglets. I did a 75, our team did a 75% resection. We placed central lines and the pigs were maintained on uh, PN. And the experimental groups were six and five in each group. And we did this by bolus feeding after running through the cartridge. And we, base, we advanced the enteral feeds and reduction on PN based on the weight gain and the stool texture and after 14 days, we looked at our results. What was interesting is that the cartridge animals had significant requirements in PN requirements, and after 14 days, they were down 19% already, which, uh, which is really good. We're happy about that. The other thing we measured was GLP-2, just as a measure in the serum. The p-value on this is 0.08, but we were 
uh, surprised to see that the GLP-2 increased, which is GLP-2 is an important factor for bowel adaptation and is the basis for GADX. What really surprised us, and uh, we weren't really intending to do this, uh, but my team did, is that the group that had the relizorb cartridge or the Alcrestic cartridge had increased their bowel length by 19.5%, while the control group had increasing bowel length of 0.7%, and that's a p-value of 0 0.03. We really didn't expect that. The other thing we saw, though they didn't measure it because they didn't tell me, is that the animals that did not receive the cartridge had more dilated bowel, and the ones that received the cartridge did not have dilated bowel. And lastly, we looked, we stained the intestines, uh, the villi, for what's called KI67, which is a proliferative measurement in the uh, crypts of the villi, and it was, uh, the proliferation was twice as much as you would see in the control group. Now it's possible that it's been shown that probably free fatty acids, possibly omega-3 fatty acids in the bowel as, as, as free fatty acids or monoglycerides may be actually a trophic factor. So we're really scratching our heads about this as this was a really surprising thing. And it may be that it may be very important to provide this right after a bowel resection when the body is actually trying to adapt. So basically, this device in animals demonstrated reduced P independence, a 19% difference in just 14 days with a P value of 0 0.002. Uh, the animals significantly increased their enteral advancement. They had similar weight gain. Their nutritional markers were excellent and the same. There's no difference in markers of liver function, so this model does not have liver disease in it. We noticed an intestinal length, which was the most remarkable thing, compared to the controls. We noticed a GPL2 elevation of point, with a p-value of 0 0.08, and the proliferation in the villi were much higher than in the control group. So the, uh, based on this work and other work, this is uh, going to uh, the FDA, the Orphan Drug Div Division, has funded us with an R01 to start the phase three study in children. The next talk I want to do uh, is a, a, a product or a, a pr molecule uh, uh, called CIFA 6179 that was created by uh, North Sea Pharma uh, Therapeutics. And this is something for parental nutrition associated liver disease. Also in this study, we also found some very surprising results. So as you know, parental nutrition is required for patients who can't absorb. It has everything in it, fluids, nutri nutrients in it. Oh, well, this group knows that. The problem is the results of long-term parental nutrition in children, the, the direct bilirubin often elevates, and if their bilirubin stays elevated, it is a fatal disease. There's often inflammation, there's steatosis in adults, and there's fibrosis over time. In fact, a baby can have cirrhosis within two months of being on parental nutrition. They can progress to end-stage liver disease, even after weaning from parental nutrition. So this molecule is a small molecule. It's an analog of a medium-chain fatty acid. It's uh, absorbed in the GI tract passively. Like I said, it's free. It's not, uh, it's not part of a triglyceride. It targets uh, PPR alpha, gamma, and also FXR, which is important for bile acid secretion. It's hypolipidemic, it's anti-inflammatory, and it reduces steatosis. And so, initial ex based on what we saw, we actually decided to do some PN models in mice first. And our hypothesis was that this molecule would prevent hepatosteatosis in a parental nutrition model in mice. Now, this mouse model is highly predictive of what actually happens in humans. And it's a model of measuring lipid handling of the liver. And so we just took a bunch of animals, mice, uh, and gave them nothing, chow, gave them MCT as a vehicle with PN, they gave them uh, PN plus intralipid, which is one of the toxins to the, to the liver, and intralipid plus the uh, molecule. 
And I would like you to look at, uh, here's PN plus IV saline. This red is oil red staining for fat. This is when the animals receive intralipid plus MCT, which is the carrier. And then in the group that received this drug, the liver was clean. Uh, and, and this is the H&E stain. So based on this, we wanted to see even more of these patients on parental nutrition often have central line infections, have inflammation, have translocation. And so we wanted to know if it would also, in a PN model, if we gave LPS lipopolysaccharide, which is mimics sepsis, and see what it would do to the liver enzymes. Well, to our surprise, we did the same groups, we, and one group with saline, and one group with LPS, which was interesting, is that uh, here's the group who, this is, control, uh, this is without LPS, this is with LPS with intralipid, this is without LPS, and this was LPS with intralipid, this is the ALT level. So it maintained normal ALT levels and maintained AST levels. So we're very pleased with that. And so the next step you want to do before you, before you go clinical is you want to do a large animal. And I really like pigs, and I hate doing these experiments, but if we don't do them, they're not going to go to patients. Um, and this is a preterm piglet model. We had to do C-sections five days early, put central lines in them, uh, not allow them to eat, keep them in an incubator, and give PN. And one group got PN plus MCT, and the other got PN plus the CIFA molecule. And our key outcomes were a direct total bilirubin, GGT, hepatic steatosis, which applies to the adults more than babies, and the hepatic fibrosis, which was uh, masked uh, by a pathologist who worked for an independent company. And all statistics were done by someone smarter than me. And so I want you to look at the lower group here. Now, this is the weight gain. The litter two is at a higher dose. One group is at 24 milligrams per kilogram. One's at 48 milligrams per kilogram. They gained weight well. And actually, their albumin levels are actually even better in the treatment group. If you look at um, bilirubin, too, this is the untreated. This is the treated, so the bilirubin stayed normal. As uh, The direct bilirubin, which is what we measure for cholestasis, also remained normal. And the GGT, which is, of course, a measure of uh, bile duct inflammation, also remained normal at the 14 days. And bile acids, as you know, is, uh, also accumulates in the patients with TPN liver injury, and the bile acid levels were much lower in these patients. Uh, patients, the piglets. You get attached to them, so they're kind of like patients. Sorry. So then we looked at the livers histologically, and this is, again, oil red O, and they're uh, very red for fat staining, and this is the treated group. So we're very happy about that. Uh, this, has been st this is measured by a uh, computer, but also we also did triglyceride analysis, and it matched up with the computer analysis. Which was what was even more surprising is the bridging fibrosis. So the blinded pathologist reviewed this. We paid a fee. They had no idea what we were asking them to do. And already in two weeks, the piglets had bridging fibrosis. But in the uh, uh, treated group, there was just a minimal amount of fibrosis. And these are the fibrosis scores by, by the matching by the pathologist. And so our conclusions are that in mirroring models of PN liver injury, and LPS injury, this molecule prevents steatosis and ALT elevation. In preterm piglets, it prevents cholestasis, steatosis, and fibrosis, or reduces the fibrosis. We had no adverse events related to the drug. And you can imagine having a preterm piglet ICU. There's some complications, but none of them were attributed to the drug. And now this study. Uh, is in a phase one clinical trial and planning for the phase two study for patients. And uh, a lot of people helped. Uh, 
I like to, of course, Kathy Gura. The work that was done with the Alcresta molecule, the lead fellow in my lab was Savas. And for the pea and liver disease, the lead fellow was Scott Fligger. And the rest of the team, of course, Kathy's always with me. And we would, uh, we had also our collaborations, collaborators. Our funding is extensive, uh, North Sea, Alcresta, Department of Surgery, Boston Children's Hospital, Vascular Biology Program, uh, the NIH, and now in the future, the FDA. Thank you. Everyone, uh, my name is uh, Pelle Jebbesen. Uh, I come from Copenhagen, uh, Denmark. Uh, I have had the privilege to be in this area for almost 30 years, and I have had uh, great collaboration with the Oli Foundation. And want to thank you for inviting me uh, here. It's uh, been a true pleasure. Friendship, collaboration, uh, having good exchange of opinions resolving our differences. I mean, this does not exist all places in Europe at the moment, so. I come here with peace. <laughs> and uh, uh, of course, I know you are good allied as well, so. <laughs> yeah, I'm here to talk about the emerging results from next generation pro-adaptive hormones. Some call them growth factors, I don't like that terminology, it, these agents does so much more. These are my uh, disclosures. Uh, please uh, do contact me if you have interesting studies and you need to do balanced studies. What we are all striving for is to improve bowel function in our patients. And we know that these patients over time, some of them adapt spontaneously and through the efforts of dietitians and, and skillful uh, physicians. But what we want to do is also, by early treatments of these patients, by, by newer medications, accelerate this adaptation. Or even better, to create a condition of hyperadaptation early after resection, but also late after uh, resection. And uh, you know uh, that all rehydration and dietary manipulation is, is important for, for these patients, and we have to uh, give an individualized treatment for these patients with antidiarrheals and antisecretory agents. Today, I'll talk about these pro-adaptive uh, factors. We have known for many years uh, that, that uh, this is not only about absorptive capacity and uh, the absorptive area here. It's many more factors uh, that uh, actually are involved in the pathophysiology of, of uh, short bowel syndrome. So these neuroendocrine changes that occur in relation to intestinal resections are responsible for, for uh, detrimental effects on motility, the secretions and digestion, absorption, blood flow and lymph flow, and perhaps also changes in the uh, microbiome. So we tend to forget that the intestine is actually one of the largest endocrine organ, uh, organs in our body. And even though uh, only 1% uh, is represented by these enteroendocrine uh, cells, they uh, produce an enormous amount of uh, hormones. Uh, and this full orchestra uh, of secretion of, of hormones leads to, to this uh, beautiful uh, music of intestinal absorption. So when we do eat and drink uh, in the lumen, uh, there's a, a stimulation of various uh, of these enteroendocrine cells, uh, and this mediates the release of hormones that 
either through neural, endocrine or paracrine uh, ways affect uh, the motility, the secretions, the mucosal function and the blood fl flow uh, in the intestine. And we have uh, a normal uh, communication between the organs in order to, to have this optimal intestinal absorption. We know that in the uh, distal bowel, there's a lot of uh, hormones secreted. So we have these so-called feedback or break hormones that could be GLP-1, GLP-2, PYY, etc. And once you have the distal part of the bowel, most of these patients actually do pretty well and can uh, be weaned off uh, parental support. So having the terminal ileum and having the colon uh, in continuity does a world of difference to uh, these patients. So figuring out what is it that these hormones in the distal part of the intestine actually do and then try to mimic this in patients who have uh, poor endogenous secretion of these hormones. That's what it's all about in this situation. So what we want to do is to restore uh, to watch normal uh, the motility and, and secretions in these patients. We want to increase absorption uh, improve blood flow and, and uh, create this condition of hyper assimilation. So we suggest uh, that these pro-adaptive or these distal intestinal hormones, they reduce the accelerated gastrointestinal transit in these patients. Once these patients eat a, or drink a cup of coffee, they can almost feel the warm coffee in their stomach bag a few minutes later. So could we pr prolong this? It's funny when you discuss with patients what is the problem and, and some of them tell them that when they go to a dinner party they have to get up and empty their stomach back again and again. And one said to me, some of the drugs you're trying out is actually a party drug. And I said, a party drug? This sounds weird. I mean, my, my teenage kids would tell me it's something else. But it's actually being able to sit at a dinner for half an hour or an hour without having to get up and, and empty your stomach back. So, so listen to the patients, hear what they say, and try to modify your treatments accordingly. So we also want to reduce these hypersecretions of the proximal bowel that many of these patients have. We want to increase the blood flow to the intestine, and we want to increase the mucosal surface area. And we want to improve barrier function, and these signaling between organs in order to improve overall intestinal absorption. And of course, you all know about Daniel Drucker, unfortunately a, a, an endocrinologist and not a gastroenterologist. He found out that, that this peptide GLP-2 could actually increase trophicity of the bowel. These are the first experiments he did, and you can see here the elongation of the villi in these patients, or these animals. Uh, treated with the, with the GLP-2. So in the initial uh, period here, you see the native uh, peptide, and we could show that when giving patients with this favorable distal, uh, preservation of this favorable distal part of the intestine, the ileum and the colon, you can see that these patients actually have an elevated endogenous secretion of GLP-1, GLP-2, probably also PYY, and this is why these patients do so well. So once I heard about the, the study of Drucker, I got hold of a native GLP-2 from a company in, in Germany, and uh, we went down there with our big purse and, and bought some peptide, and then we divided it into eight patients' doses, and, and that is how the first uh, trial was run in short bowel patients with, uh, uh, without a colon, and we could, in this proof of concept study, eight patients published in gastroenterology. So it was uh, in the good old days, uh, no uh, placebo groups, nothing, just showing here that, that this was an effective uh, treatment. And of course, thereafter, uh, uh, other companies had, uh, the, could provide us with uh, this modification uh, of native GLP-2, just a single amino acid replacement here, tiduglutide, which had all the beneficial effects uh, shown in, in both uh, animal studies and in clinical studies to increase the, the uh, small uh, intestinal weight, uh, creating this hyperplasia of the intestine and increasing the length. And we had the privilege to work with others to do these balance studies, metabolic balance studies, where you do double portions of everything the patients eat and drink, and then you uh, collect uh, the excreta, the stools and the urine, and when you know what comes in and what comes out, then you know what is absorbed. 
and we did uh, treatments, as you can see here, uh, for 21 days, repeated these balance studies, and then we took away a drug. And the nice thing uh, we could show here is that in these patients, they're very heterogeneous, but you'll see that they could reduce uh, their uh, fecal uh, wet weight from 2.8 kilos down to 2.1 kilos within just uh, three weeks of uh, treatment. The problem is when you take away uh, the peptide uh, here, the hormone, of course you lose the effect, just as you would lose the effect uh, in, in diabetic patients when you take away the insulin. But it did lead to increases in in intestinal wet weight absorption. The, uh, the patient had a, a better uh, uh, hydration and therefore they could urinate more. And this was also nice to see that they actually, when uh, taking biopsies from these patients, had uh, elongation of, of the villi. But again, the problem was when you take away the drug, uh, they will revert to baseline levels. So you can see here what we do uh, with these agents that improve absorption is that we increase urine production, we reduce their uh, fecal output, and thereby Having better hydrational status, we can reduce their parental support, and this is what the patients want. Sometimes I do give these patients days off, even though they do not really qualify for it, but it's so important for their quality of life. Sometimes you can get by by giving them more parental support the day before, and then just providing them a, a day, day off, and you'll be their best friend for, for years after. So, uh, following this phase two uh, trial, we had uh, to do uh, phase three trials. It takes an awful lot of time. It's an awful lot of work. Uh, the STEPS trial here with tiduglutide, patients were randomized to receiving tiduglutide or placebo. And uh, then, of course, we had the positive uh, outcome here. 63% of the patients receiving active treatment could have at least a 20% reduction in their parental support at weeks 20 and maintained at uh, week uh, 24. You'll see that many of these patients receiving placebo also had an effect. But when looking into data, you could actually see that, that the investigators were very aggressive on trying to weaning off uh, parental support. And, and these patients actually had to compensate for increasing their oral intakes. And that worked in patients with a colon in continuity. These patients can improve their hydrational status just by drinking more. The problem is they need the energy at the same time. So they were protocol violators, but no one discusses this. <laughs> The good thing about uh, this agent is, of, of course, these reductions in parental support. You'll see uh, a reduction around four liters uh, uh, per week. And what you'll also see that more than 50% of these patients can achieve a day off, and, and some of them even uh, more than two days uh, off parental support. So this matters uh, to patients. You need to know that the effects is, is not only on having fewer days, it's also about reducing stomal output, all the inconveniences rate related uh, to parental support. And this is of course a nice uh, slide showing that these are the reductions from around 13 liters of parental support week per week uh, down to around five uh, liters if you treat uh, long enough. Of course you never know in an open label uh, study when you don't have a placebo arm here, is this actually spontaneous adaptation occurring or is it truly the drug? We found in post hoc analysis that those patients who had the highest requirements for parental support were those who had the biggest effect of this drug. This means that these patients cannot be weaned off parental support, but their infusion times are much less. Some of these patients spend up to 16 hours of, of, of their life every day hooked up to their parental support, and if you can diminish that to eight hours, you'll also be their friend. But at the other end of the spectrum, you have those patients, mainly those with a colon in continuity, uh, the borderline patients whom you can actually get off parental support. And this is, of course, also a game, game changer. Tiduglutide needs to be taken on a daily basis. Now companies are pursuing uh, uh, the uh, uh, development of uh, agents that can be taken once or twice weekly. This is glipaglutide. We had the privilege of doing this phase two trial. I won't go much into details. It's a complicated uh, trial with many doses, a washout period. We had balance studies done again in these patients, and then uh, they received one of the other doses in, in the second period. 
The good news is that this re uh, treatment with this agent actually also uh, led to the reduction in fecal weight weight output around six, 700 uh, grams uh, per day, increasing the relative uh, uh, absorption. Yeah, it's just the same. When you reduce the output, you increase the absorption and you urinate more as a consequence of your better hydrational status. Then yet another company is developing uh, this, uh, another uh, GLP-2, uh, also with the half-life uh, injected uh, once weekly. And I had a, a very skilled a PhD student, Johanna Eliasen, who did two studies uh, with apraglutide. One of them was actually done on, with the outcome of being uh, urine production. So again, the first phase two trial where there was a placebo control in and uh, a, a, a crossover uh, design and then an open label uh, extension study uh, and follow up. And uh, Johanna was actually able uh, to, to do another study where we did, did these metabolic balance studies and treated these patients with aproglutide before and after and could show on the gold standard uh, methodology that we could increase energy absorption in these patients. And these are the results from Johanna's uh, work. You'll see uh, that there's an increase in urine production of around 700 milliliters per day in these two doses. Nothing happens when you treat with uh, placebo. This is not allowed, but I'll do it. You can actually uh, compare across uh, studies here and see the effects. You'll see that the urine output here is, is increasing by around 40% when using tadoglutide on a daily basis. You will find that when using glipaglutide on a once daily basis, you will find the same numbers. And when you use apraglutide, uh, which was only used once weekly, in this phase two program, you also see this number around 40%. So increasing wet weight absorption, you'll see 700 grams. You'll see somewhere around 700 grams here, somewhere around 700 grams here. So I think on the wet weight absorption part, these, these uh, treatments seem to be pretty comparable. It seems as if we're reaching a plateau where we do not get uh, something else by even prolonging uh, the half-life even more. But of course the patients will love to have injections with a ready-to-use device once weekly instead of having to do this cumbersome uh, dissolution and, and, and injection on a daily basis. The findings so far shows effects on energy absorption. It seems to be slightly uh, better in apraglutide here. We don't know whether this is for, for real uh, or uh, whether this is just to, to uh, a coincidence. We found also effects on, on the macronutrients absorption using the glipaglutide once uh, daily. So we are now eagerly awaiting these phase three data from, from Sealand Pharma. They'll be around in, in late summer and hopefully we will have once weekly uh, uh, treatments that are effective. We're also waiting for the apraglutide phase three trials uh, uh, outcome here uh, in, in this uh, situation, but it may take a few years. It's really tough to include patients into these studies. Those who are involved will know that it'll, it'll take a lot of valuable time from you. Uh, sometimes these, these, we know these drugs work, uh, but it, it steals a lot of time for, for doing such uh, interesting studies as Mark Puda is doing. I mean, this is uh, what, what really uh, makes uh, new things happen. There's also yet another agent, please no more GLP-2s, we've had enough. <laughs> Where do we go from here? We, we did a GLP-1 study, Mark Wiesendale, one of my PhD students, I won't go into much detail, basics are, are all the same. We had a baseline uh, 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 metabolic balance studies, then we treated patients uh, uh, with this uh, liraglutide, repeated the balance studies later on. And again here we could show that in patients with angiogenostomy, we uh, could see that reductions were seen in uh, ostomy output, 500 grams in, in that range leading to increase in wet weight absorption and therefore leading to increases in urine production as well. And the beauty of this uh, was also being able to show that we actually had an increase in energy absorption using GLP-1s as well. Positive effects on, on carbohydrate and protein absorption. 
So now coming up is Vurulu uh, Lentaid. I, I can't even pronounce it yet. Uh, it was uh, a study uh, where uh, they increased the dose, treated uh, nine patients uh, with this uh, GLP-1 uh, agonists and actually found uh, pretty good results. But again, in those who had the highest baseline uh, stool outputs are those who benefit the most from these agents. And that's the problem because that means you will be, it'll be difficult to use these agents to get patients all off parental support unless they have a colon and continuity. So that's the situation. So these are preliminary uh, results, but impressive uh, in the sense that you could re do reductions in their total stool output around 40%. So certainly the GLP-1s also work together with the GLP-2s. Perhaps combining these will be, be uh, even more uh, effective. And we're now waiting for, for the uh, phase two trials here. They're spending uh, only 24 hours for, for measurements of, uh, of outputs. I, I think this is uh, dangerous. I mean, these patients fluctuate a lot from day to day. Uh, I also know the heterogeneity in, in, in these patients and having these uh, dose uh, escalations and, and, and uh, changes here is, is uh, yeah, it's informative, but will it actually tell which dose should be used in, in these patients? We'll see how it, how, how it fares. So, uh, plenty more ideas, a lot of other agents that, that could be used in the, this situation. I spent 30 years on, on the first 10 here, so uh, it'll take another uh, 30 years. Uh, so, someone who is uh, young and, and ambitious, please contact me, come to Denmark. It could be interesting. Thanks a lot. Well, if anyone has wondered who suddenly sneaked up here on me, <laughs> this is Manpreet Mundi. He's an endocrinologist at the Mayo Clinic. And um, when, I went, when I was trying to retire and went off the Home Artificial Nutrition Group with ESPEN, I said, how, how do we replace me? And they said, well, Oli can do that. So here he is, my colleague. Matt and Pete Mundy, and I'm so thrilled with the fact that he is working with ESPEN, too, um, and looking at a variety of guidelines. So thank you, Matt and Pete. Um, now, the last one is um, a patient of mine, well, was before I retired, <laughs> um, and he, well, he has been on TP, home parental nutrition for 44 years. He started just as he was graduating from college, and um, he has been a great patient. His compliance is amazing, which is really helpful to those taking care of him. But at any rate, um, we asked him to do a virtual presentation a quick virtual presentation on his 44 years of uh, home parental nutrition, and he added, and still counting. So if we can get that. I can do that. OK. You're better at technology than I am. Thank you for um, allowing me to come here and speak to you. Um, I just appreciate uh, the introduction by Dr. Kelly. And I also appreciate Dr. Kelly. Um, she has been my doctor at Mayo Clinic for probably 20 plus years. And uh, we've become good friends over that period of time. And uh, I can't say enough about her. Um, she's just been uh, super uh, as far as keep taking care of me and uh, keeping me healthy. So Dr. Kelly, um, thank you. All right, a few years back, I attended the Oli Conference near Chicago. It was the first conference that I had, had attended. I was impressed with the parental nutrition users there that were there in attendance. They all looked so healthy 
But I knew behind all of those healthy faces were years of physical hits of fatigue, nausea, cramping, diarrhea, surgeries, and pain. And on top of that, years of emotional waves of fear, distrust, hopelessness, and discouragement. The switch got flipped for us, and all of you and the people before you flipped that switch. We now have lives that are livable, sustainable, and productive. Thank you for your dedication in this field of medicine. We as PNers have been blessed because of it. I, I will give you a bit of my history, where it all began. In the mid-60s, I was attending the University of Montana. I was on a basketball scholarship and also playing collegiate baseball. I'm telling you this because I was strong, healthy, and very active at 6'2", weighing about 185 pounds. In the winter of 68-69, the Hong Kong flu hit our campus hard. It was right before our Christmas quarterly break. The infirmary was full of students. Hallways were filled with cots. I brought books to a friend for his finals, and as I was walking home, I felt sick. I missed my finals and flew back to Wisconsin. I thought within a week or two, I would feel better, but the nausea, diarrhea, and fatigue lasted into February. I was finally diagnosed with Crohn's. Sick and not feeling good, I finished the second quarter of classwork and student taught in the third quarter. I flew back home at 155 pounds, weak and tired. My family doctor just put me into bed rest for the summer I ended up canceling my teaching contract because I just couldn't manage it, feeling sick and no energy. For the next nine years, I was treated with sulfa drugs, emodium, and cortisone. Nothing helped. I had three surgeries during this time, a resection of the small bowel, an ileostomy, then a partial removal of the stomach. After the stomach surgery, it was becoming more difficult to absorb food, and I was losing weight. I was now at 130. In December of 77, I was hospitalized for some hydration fluids, but I was failing, and I knew it. While in the hospital, my family doctor wanted me to talk with a young gastroenterologist who had just finished his studies at the Mayo Clinic. He talked to me about a new program that day that they had, and that program was home parental nutrition. It didn't take much to convince me. I flew from Wisconsin to Rochester within the next week. I, I checked in at 105 pounds. I became the 16th patient to have this life-saving catheter placed in me. As I was waking up from the procedure in the recovery room, I could feel the energy flowing in my body again. I didn't, I hadn't felt that in nearly 10 years. And you know, as I wrote this out, and those memories came back. Um, I just teared up because that point in time was so memorable to me. My appreciation goes out to Dr. Fleming, the director of the program, and to Sharon Berkner, pharmacist, who was in charge of my TPN training. I was educated extensively five days a week to prepare myself for home independence. Their expertise and friendship was immeasurable. I was gaining a pound a day. After 30 days, I went home at 135 pounds. 
I began administering the TPN and also making the TPN. I would pick up cases of bottled dextrose and Travisol, along with vitamins and minerals at our local hospital and each day build my own TPN solution. I was asked by Andrea, was this a difficult adjustment? I think for an individual who, for example, was in a car accident and due to the trauma was now immediately uh, was in need of HPN to sustain their life, it would be a difficult adjustment. For me, to have that energy flowing in me again, making and ministering my TPN was a privilege. I couldn't have been happier. I think that it is important to mention here that the support that I received from Mayo Clinic's TPN staff, and then later when Quorum took over my supplies, that this working and coordinated relationship was extremely important in my ongoing health. Marsha Boltwright with Quorum, who was basically my visiting nurse, provided continued education and always lended an ear if I had a complaint or two. Plus, over the years, my annual checkups at Mayo and their vigilant monitoring my TPN, along with dealing with my infections, can, contributed to my overall health. Why do I say this? Because I saw the other side. I knew individuals who were placed on TPN and were not team or program supported. I have learned over the 40 years plus years that TPN is a complicated process. Its application needs expertise from multiple disciplines working together and zeroed in on each patient. If you don't have this team program approach, this is what I saw in, my, in, in people that I knew. Delays in treatment, confusion in treatment, overlap of treatment, and sporadic, sporadic blood, blood work. All of this places a burden on the patient. A patient on TPN, it must be kept simple. Their job is to administer safely and stay away from infection. They cannot be wondering and questioning, how do I get immediate response and care when I need it? I say all of this because it is so disheartening to see individuals struggle when they could be in the hands that are more could be in hands that are more supportive. I continue to progress in the following months, and in May, I attended my friend's wedding in Montana. I weighed 150 pounds. I spent the following nine years coaching baseball and girls basketball. Even though I was feeling good, the cost of the TPN was a deterrent to getting hired for a job and getting accepted by the company's insurance plan. When the Disability Act came into law, I began to pursue a master's degree in education, an MSED in school counseling. I was able to finish my degree and then work as an elementary school counselor for 22 years. I was married during this time. My wife, Jane, and I celebrated 20 years together last July. I'm involved with Meals on Wheels, ministry work with the special needs people, and providing car, car rides for the elderly. I still enjoy playing tennis, golf, gardening, and walking my dog. I would just like to thank you again for being able to just share my story. Thank you. Wow. You know, I, I was just thinking, I mean, I think he's the reason why we 
spend the hours in clinic and the lab and you know doing all the work we do which is just an incredible story um, sorry we didn't have to get cozy there weren't uh, wireless mics so we're gonna improvise so we um, this has just been a tremendous session so first I just want to thank the Oli staff for putting this together a, a big round of applause Thank the audience. Big round of applause for you all. What a way to uh, start the Aspen Conference and also thank the speakers. And we're going to have to somehow get you up here too. Um, but in the last, we've got six minutes left to kind of look at the journey that we've been, you know, in terms of home parental nutrition, where we're going, but then also to discuss some of the challenges ahead. Because I, I think, you know, we've gone from an era where patients, you know, this was a life-ending disease to where we could successfully do it at home, but that required them to compound TPN and do all of these things to now where they can safely do it and have the life that Lee has lived. Uh, and really enjoy this. Um, but what's also happened is that when we look at the numbers, especially in the US, you know, by like 1980s, with all of the HPN centers that were there, we had successfully given HPN to about 2,000 patients. By 1994, Dr. Lynn Howard's research showed this number had grown to 40,000. But then, we started to see a shift away from centers managing these patients to more handing over a lot of the management to infusion companies. Um, but then really with that, even though they do a great job, we've had a loss of that nutrition expertise. And this trend continues even to this day. So we, we recently did a, a study looking at data from 2013 Medicare data. and. Over 6,000 patients were on TPN covered by Medicare. And how many providers do you think signed the prescriptions for those patients? It was, it was close to 6,000. So almost a one-to-one -one ratio of provider to patient. Uh, we've been working, Kishore and I have, have been working on this just recently. And another study looking at a completely new data set also shows the same thing. And it shows that some of these patients are traveling over a 1,000 miles to get the care that they need. So I think there's a lot of challenges ahead of us. And I tried to break down those challenges into key categories. You know, one of the big pressures is financial, right? Most of us as physicians and providers are being asked to see more patients, less time, but to really focus our, our practice on procedures and surgeries, et cetera. Uh, another challenge, and this was brought up a few times, is the electron, uh, electronic health record. We recently switched to one with four letters. I won't say those letters. Um, you know, and, and we were told it would be efficient and give us more time and all of these, but the opposite has happened. We have kind of gained more distance from our patients, right? We spend less time face to face and now more time doing other things. Um, and another big, you know, area where I think we need a lot more work is education. And I pulled up some data here and found that 25% of medical schools offer the minimum of 25 hours that are recommended of nutrition education over four years. And when we look at, you know, postgraduates, so I finished med school, I go into residency, only 26% of residencies actually have a nutrition curriculum in their program, in their entire training program. So there's a lot of big gaps that we need to address. That's why I moved all the chairs, because I don't have any answers. So I'm <laughs> going to start leaning over here now uh, to, the, uh, to our panelists to give me some answers. And, We'll start with education. And I think, you know, Kishore does not get enough credit here. I mean, we joke a lot because he's just a great human being, but he does not get enough credit for the work he's doing with Lift Echo. Seriously. You know, it, it's, 
we know the funding situation, you know, and this is a lot of sweat equity that he's putting in to get this up and going, and the data he showed was just incredible. So thank you for all your effort. So now, can you solve education for us? We've got two minutes. <laughs> Another five million dollars later. I, I, I will say one thing. I want to correct an oversight. I left at the conclusion slide, and I failed to acknowledge the very, very significant support we've received from Takeda to support the Lift Echo project, but it's not enough. Uh, so efforts like this, Medicare funders, insurance companies don't pay for improving education, improving training, improving training in medical schools, improving training in fellowships, where on a fee-for-service model, we'll never improve care for such sick patients unless things change. And I really applaud uh, Takeda particularly but also shout out to the other pharma companies as you're doing all this drug development that is desperately needed and supporting brilliant research that we heard from Mark and uh, Palais. Uh, support for uh, organizations like the Oli Foundation, for patient education, for clinician education is just as important. We'll keep plugging away in the meanwhile. Perfect. Um, the next one is, there's more questions? Uh, early seven? You mean? Uh, the, the first yeah. Yeah. 1970. Dr. Schills and Scribner both kind of at the same time. So Dr. Scribner was actually a nephrologist here at U University of Washington, and he he used a lot of the same techniques for hemodialysis. And at least in the U.S., kind of at that time, published what he called the concept of the artificial gut to do this at home. So it was 1970. So how much longer after that did it take for pediatric patients to be sent home? Ooh, good question. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, that's a good question. Actually, first, first, the first pediatric patient, if I remember correctly, Lynn, maybe correct me, but was uh, Doug Wilmore report. Uh, I, I, uh, at, at, actually was from CHOP. I want to say 1969 or 70 was a single case report. We'll have to look at that one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the longest one that I, I had that started as an infant was 42 years old now. Yeah, I think we're having a discussion about the first, you know, regular pediatric patients going home, and then you mentioned your, your longest patient is 42 now and started as an infant. Yeah. Yeah. Incredible. Um, okay, so... Speaking of these kind of programs, I think I'll turn it over to you now to kind of discuss, you know, where do you think the future is in terms of a multidisciplinary team uh, for providing recognition and how do we preserve or expand those? Um, I think there's no question that home PN care is a multidisciplinary process and needs every aspect, every professional that has been engaged so far. Um, the question is, how can we find ways to train physicians and to um, reward their efforts so that it's worth their while to do? Mm -hmm. The solution we've come to is not necessarily a great one, but we have tried to make it easier and make it more feasible and to provide care where it wasn't before. But one of the things that has, has not really come up here that I feel like I'm seeing, and I'm glad to be with this crew to ask this question, I feel like in the early days of home PN care, um, we got people with short gut and a few with dysmotility. 
And these days, we're getting people with many more very complex disorders, mitochondrial syndrome, all kinds of complexity where uh, many of them will not come off of PN, so HPN is not going away, but we need really highly trained practitioners to understand the best approaches. Maybe some of the easier work of getting some people off, now we know who we can get off, mm -hmm. um, and so they're not there anymore. So now these others that require so much are outpacing it. No, excellent. And, and Dr. Jepson, if we can turn this over to you also to kind of share your, you know, story of how you've been able to build the program you have in Denmark and, and sort of, you know, preserve, I don't know if that's the right word, or fight off successfully uh, some of the challenges to building that program. Yeah, but our, our healthcare system is totally different. And, and, and we received the recognition of this rare organ failure, intestinal failure, politically. And, and this makes it much easier to deal in this environment because we, we want to be able to provide this home front nutrition uh, just as, as easy as uh, patients with renal failure get dialysis. And, and, and if you keep on pushing this anal analogy, I mean, you get the awareness and then you get the funding, so. Yeah, incredible, true. Uh, and then last but not least, <laughs> you know, we heard about the future of, of, I guess, the academic work of, you know, intestinal failure, and I think the future is really bright. What, what everyone has shown us today uh, is just tremendous, and I'm very excited about that. But how do we engage more individuals? How do we excite, you know, up and coming individuals to carry on your work, to, to not let the pooter lab go anywhere and, and build upon that? Yeah, well, you have to get the younger people excited, of course. And uh, that's pretty difficult because uh, you're talking about payment for this, the research money for, the, you know, even though the NIDDK is on this, but the people on the study sections are not generally people who are clinical practitioners who really understand the disease. I just sent a grant to them and they go, well, we don't have any problem with, you know, liver or short bowel issues anymore. Uh, <laughs> and so what do you do with that, right? Yeah. Uh, but getting people excited and welcoming to these kind of organizations like the Oli Foundation and Aspen who are doing this and welcoming them, welcoming them, welcoming them to it which is the best I can think you can do. And also advocacy and education for people. At, it's not a problem with the FDA so much as it was. It's more of a problem with the funding organizations like the NIH. Yeah, great point. Okay, so with that, we're a little over time. I apologize, and we've got, you know, the president's speech coming up. So thank you again so much, and thank you for <laughs> Yes, thanks so much, you guys. I really have appreciated the help that you've given us. So. Okay. Well, if I could just have a one minute of your time. I have a presentation. Dr. Mundy, I want to announce that he's rotated off of the Ole Foundation Board of Directors. And we were, we were sad to see him go, so we didn't let him go. So I have a plaque for Dr. Mundy that says, for his many years of service with Ole Foundation, we couldn't imagine shifting him away, rotating him anywhere but to replace Dr. Kelly. What do you think about that? <laughs> and I'm going to congratulate him for this. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Welcome back. He, so we said, we'll see you later. And then immediately said, Welcome back. How good is this? Thank you all for coming. Really, you've been a great audience.